Right now, it's my um, privilege to present um, today's topic, which is helping vulnerable people recover. What does success look like? Our um, speaker today is Shauna Panay, and Shauna is going to talk to us about her journey with sobriety. When society says addicts will never change, she is living proof of the contrary. She came from being on the streets for 14 years, doing whatever it took to get drugs and alcohol. She went to Streets Alive because they had been working with her for the whole 14 years and never gave up on her. When she was ready for change, they were there for her, giving her housing and a safe place to call home. She actually had a bed to sleep in and ongoing love and support. Now. She is the assistant director of the Streets Alive Genesis program, where she gets to work with women in need, bringing them into recovery and seeing them change. I'd like to introduce to you today's speaker, Shauna Panay. Good afternoon, everyone. As, as she said, my name is Shauna Panay. I'm really honored to be able to come here and speak today. I was really excited, and um, and uh, I, I love I love speaking, and I love uh, telling my story of of where I was and where I am today. So a little bit about my story is what I'm going to say is I was a, a client at Streets Alive for 14 years. So basically, I was on the streets. I was homeless. I had absolutely nothing. I had family that didn't want anything to do with me. I. Um, I did anything that I could to get drugs and alcohol. I was, you know, was walking around with dirty. Sometimes I'd be walking around with only like one shoe. They used to call me One Shoe Shauna, and they actually still do once in a while. <laughs> it's kind of a joke around there. They're like, hey, One Shoe Shauna, if they see one shoe lying somewhere. And it's kind of funny now, but at the time it, was, it wasn't really funny because I needed a shoe. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so. I started drinking actually at the age of six and I was force fed alcohol. So I learned at a very, very young age how to drink. Uh, I had an abuser in my life who was feeding me alcohol and being able to do the things that he wanted to. And so at a young age, I knew how what alcohol would do to me and what it, how it made me feel. And it took all my inhibitions away. It made me black out so I actually wouldn't remember things. Um, it took all my feelings away. So I knew already at a young age what, what alcohol would do for me. And, and I started to enjoy it. So as I grew up and into my younger, my later life, you know, and into my teens, I, I realized that alcohol was still a big part of my life. You know, and at that time, I was only like a weekend drinker, but when I drank and I drank and I partied, I would get completely, ob ob you know, oblivious. I wouldn't remember where I was. I wouldn't remember where I woke up. I wouldn't remember the things happening. And sometimes that was uh, really horrifying for me. And that was, you know, it, it began to be a cycle because all I knew was how to drink and so all the things that I had done when I was drinking I was always shameful the next day because either I didn't remember or people would tell me and they'd be like you did this this and this and I'd be like oh my gosh I can't believe that I'd done that you know and so that would be another reason for right reason for me to drink <laughs> um, I, I decided when I was 25 I got married and um, after all the abuse and having a horrible childhood and stuff, I managed to get a job and I was a functioning part of society and you know, and I only drank on the weekends, so I thought it was okay. And when I got married, I, I, I got uh, pregnant and four times I had lost a baby and after the fourth baby, they told me I could no longer have children. And for that, that really devastated me because I always wanted to be a mother and I wanted to be a mother and, and have, a ch have children and bring them up differently than what I was brought up, right? And so that devastated my whole life. And so from there, that's when um, the depression started to kick in and my drinking started to kick in full time. I, I, my husband would come home every night. I'd be completely drunk, passed out. You know, there was just, I was living no life until finally he got to the point where he couldn't deal with me. And I couldn't deal with the fact that I was never ever gonna be able to have children. And so I started to drink and drink really heavy. And my husband had kicked me out. And I remember getting in my car with a basic few things and putting the TV in the back and heading to Lethbridge. And when I ha headed to Lethbridge, I met some really tough going people and stuff. And, you know, next thing I know, I ended up getting impaired. I lost my car. Pretty sure I sold my TV. And I ended up absolutely having nothing and walking the streets of Lethbridge sometimes at night. 
you know, and I'd, I'd have moments of, of times where I really wanted to get help, and I was, I was in and out of jail as well because of my drinking. I was uh, actually assaulting officers, and I don't know how little old me would beat up an officer, but apparently I did. So <laughs> they put me in jail a, a few times for that, and um, jail didn't seem to help me at the time. I would get out, and it would just seem like, okay, I'm just ready to start my cycle over again, and because that's the way, and, and with, when, you, when you drink so hard and you do the things that you do, you lose all your self-worth. You have no pride in yourself. You don't think that you can succeed in life because you've lost everything, and you're at the bottom of the bottom, right? And that's what I believed, and so that's what kept me out there for so long, because, you know, I remember crying and saying to, to uh, a good friend or a mentor to mine is, I, is, I don't know, this hurt and the pain just won't go away, right? And the only way that the hurt and pain would go away was if I decided to uh, drink and continue, and then all of a sudden I met crack cocaine. And I also started doing crack cocaine. So now I was addicted to two things and not just one. And crack cocaine, crack cocaine took me way further than, you know, with the alcohol as well. And I ended up in drug houses and bad places and places that I never, ever thought I'd go. And I remember going to Streets Alive, and, and I had met, actually, uh, Pastor Julie in, in uh, jail. She does a WOW program every Friday afternoon for the women, and I had met her in there. And there was something intriguing about this lady that I didn't know that she, that was, you know, she just had this love and this smile, and she gave the best hugs, and I couldn't figure out what it was that she had that I wanted, right? And so when I had gotten out of jail, I connected with her, and I started, you know, she started offering me some help. and. I would, I would take the help and, uh, you know, she would help me get into detox and treatment and things like that. But I wasn't ready at those times that she was offering me because I still had part of me that still wanted to be out there. It was really hard to let me go, uh, to let go of the lifestyle that I had only known, you know, for so many years. And, and that was how I, ch I was living. And I didn't know how to change, or, nor did I feel like I was could change. But she was always, always there to offer me help. And so... She uh, she never ever gave up on me. She always always believed on me. So four and a half years ago, I was at the worst that I'd ever been. I was completely swollen. I had walked into Streets Alive because I knew that there was something really really terribly wrong with me. I had walked into Streets Alive and it looked like I was nine months pregnant and my eyes were completely yellow. Every part of my body was swollen and I was scared. Right? I, I wasn't sure what was really going on. So I asked if they could help me to get into detox one more time because I, I, I was honestly scared I was going to die. Which sometimes is really odd because when I was drinking and stuff, sometimes I didn't. I didn't even care if I lived or died, and that's how that's how bad it was for me. But I finally had this this moment where I, you know, I I, I needed to do something, and so I cr pretty much crawled on my hands and knees there. And so they got me out to detox, and when I went to detox, they had to hospitalize me because of my withdrawals and and from the drugs and the alcohol was so bad. I could I was shaking so bad, and I was just crying, and I knew there was something deeply wrong with me. So they they had to hospitalize me, and I went to the hospital, and they started doing tests on. Me and the doctor said to me, he said, he says, you have a choice, Shauna. He walked in and he did, had to finish all the tests and he says, all your organs are steady, starting to shut down and you have cirrhosis of the liver. He says, if you choose to go back out there now, you will die. And for me, that was just like, Oh my gosh, I, you know, I, this is really going to kill me. You know what? And, and it was really what happened is I ended up getting on my hands and knees and I ended up asking God. I said, okay, God, praying to God because people had shown me there was a God, but I never ever kept him in my life for a long time. And so I, I had asked, I got on my hands and knees and I prayed to God. I said, okay, God, if you get me through this one more time, if you help me to, to get through this one more time, I'm going to do this. And I promise I will never have, I will never drink or use drugs again. And from that day, I've been sober and clean ever since. And it was... <laughs> It it, uh, it definitely wasn't easy uh, to get sober and clean. I, I I did the detox and then I did the treatment thing, and I had I had lots of love and support from uh, Streets Alive, and you know they helped me and they put me into their housing and stuff, and they offered me the house that I had gone into, and for me uh, it. 
where I had been and been in jail and stuff, I always felt like places were like institutions. But when they offered me this home and I went into it and it was like this beautiful home and you know, I had my own room and I had like warm, clean blankets and I had, you know, a kitchen I could walk in and I could open up the fridge and I could take, you know, whatever I wanted to eat out at that time. And for somebody that was, that was on the streets and absolutely had nothing, you have no idea what that meant to me. It gave me back dignity in my life. It gave me back uh, the feeling of self-worth that maybe I do deserve this better life. Maybe it is okay for me to actually go and be able to go into a kitchen and, and be able to have food and not have to steal it or anything and have a nice backyard and have people that just loved and supported me wherever I went, right? I started, you know, oh, these doors started opening and next thing I knew they were, put, God, God was putting like place, people in my life that were helping me and I mean, what I had to work through, but that was just the beginning, right? They offered me counseling. They sent me to counseling, so I had to do some hard work from the trauma from my past. So I went to Crossroads Counseling, and I started working on the things from my past, like all the trauma, and I started to deal with stuff. And then next thing I knew, like, months were going by and I was getting sobriety and for me that was amazing because you can tell ask any one of my friends that knew me back then, I was the one they figured that was going to die out there. And so I started getting the proper counseling. I started doing programming and learning how to live all over again. Because when you're out there, you totally forget how to live. Like, you have no responsibilities when you're out there. So I had to learn how to pay bills again. I had to learn how to trustee money. And what I did for the first little while is I allowed Streets Alive to trustee my money because I couldn't even trust myself with a lot of money, right? And so they, they helped me do that as well. And then just being in a safe home and learning how to live and do chores and mow a lawn and, and doing it with pride and giving my sense of self-worth back. That's what I got from all that. And then next thing I know, I, like, I have no idea how they did it, but the Streets Alive offered me a job and I was like, really? You want to hire me? You know, have you, you know where I came from and you're offering me, me a job? And I, and I was pretty grateful and I was pretty blessed and I had to think about it because most of the clients that were coming in were people that I used to use drugs and stuff with. So I actually got to to work with them as well. And so four years later now, I you know I started working in the pin bank and then all of a sudden, like two years ago, Julie asked me if I wanted to start work working with the women because by then I'd actually been able to live on my own, pay my rent and have a place to call home for like, the first plate basement suite I had, I had over for a year and the landlord came down and he says, Gee, would you like to uh, start your lease again? And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, you're, you're available to start the lease again or you can move. And I was like, well, I've never had that before. Usually I've always got kicked out of places, right? I have an option. <laughs> so, and, you know, and I was able to make sure like all my bills and stuff are paid. And wow, you know, that just gave me so much excitement in my life that I was, I was living, you know, what people call like normal. Right, and I was doing a good job. I had some money in the bank, and I was able to go and buy something if I wanted to, and that was the meaning of it behind it. And so now, uh, I, now that I am the assistant director of the women's program, now I get to watch other successes. Right, we have a women's recovery house, two women's recovery house. We have one that's uh, first and second stage, so that's pre-treatment or post-treatment pre-treatment and then after treatment, which we, pre-treatment is that they go to detox and if we want to be the gap filler. So between sometimes detox and treatment, there's a gap. You can get them out to detox, they're there for six days, but sometimes there's a gap that you have to wait because there's a waiting list for treatment. So we want to fill that gap. So what we do is we'll take the client after they've done their detox, put them in our house, and then we wait and then we take them to treatment. And then after treatment, we reassure them that we say, here you got another 30 days or however long the treatment center is, and then we have it, their bed is still safe so they have a place to come back to, right? And that's really important because if you don't have that, where do you go, right? Where do you go between treatment or detox and treatment, right? You go right back to what you used to. So we want to be those gap fillers that we want to make sure that they have that safe place and the love and support to come to back when they're done those things. And then that's when the real work starts for them. So then we have phase two, which is programming. So what we do is we have, it, we have our own building now on Fifth Avenue South and they come in every day 
them, it's like a job for them is what we do because we believe in keeping them busy and, and getting things done. So from nine o'clock till three every day, they're required to do programming in the house. And so they do um, different courses. We have, our, we have healthy boundaries for toxic relationships. We have mixed media journaling, which speaks to the soul of the women. We have 12 step work, um, dealing with relevant issues like isolation, rejection, and significant family members and significant others, quieting the voice of shame and guilt and enabling and so much more. And so we do a lot of hard work with them and that they're, be, they're able to gain their self-worth and stuff back we know that most addictions are trauma-based, so our program is, is, is focused on a lot of heart issues and that we, and that we outs outsource counseling for any of our other partif participants who want to go. So we have a place called Crossroads Counseling that we work really close with together. So we will send them to Crossroads Counseling so that they're able to get the proper help that they need for trauma or depression or anxiety. We also send them to mental health as well. We have two clients that have, done, have gone to mental health and have done successfully well. Um, we do that to ensure that at the end of their mental health is better than at the beginning. The stigma of recovery needs to be dismantled with compassion. We have compassion, right? When they walk through our doors, it's not, oh, okay, you've done this, you've done this wrong. It's like, what can we do to help you to move forward? Where can we start? What are the basis of what we need to do to help you? And we, we don't... Um, and we also have it like in our house. We, we, do, we do know there is relapses and stuff in the house. So we're very like, if they relapse, they're still, because the, the, the house is abstinence. There's no alcohol, there's no drugs allowed. There's um, no guests over. The rules are, they have curfews. Uh, they have things like they can't have their cell phones for 30 days. Uh, so we have pretty strict rules in the house. And the one house that we've been there for, had, we've had for almost seven years, we have not had one complaint in the seven years that it's been there. Um, the women have moved on, to the, some of the women that have moved on to our third stage housing are actually, and it's, it's, it's so, uh, such a great success to see. We have two, one is going to the college, she wants to get into her social masters, so she's been with us for well over a year now. We have two other women that, that are successfully back out in the workforce with amazing jobs and doing really, really well. We have one girl, she just got her children back and just moved into her own house and is doing really well. She, so she, what she does every day, she still believes in our programming and the love that we have for her. So she'll take her kids to daycare and still come and do our programming throughout the day. And we allow that. We also allow women that are out in the community because there is some people that are still troubled or whatever, but have houses or just got no support or whatever. So we will also bring people like women in from the community as well to take our courses to keep them busy. Um, we also, at Genesis, we help navigate people through the systems which are intimidating and overwhelming. So a lot of the women that they'll, they want to get into get help and stuff, financing is a really big problem, like getting help from the government and stuff. And so what I particularly do is I help them to go to Alberta Works and stuff, and if it's to get into our program and stuff, I help them to get on the funding and things that they need, or I navigate them to certain counselors, or I navigate them through age work or whatever it seems that they need, I help to do that as well, and even housing as well. We, we, we help them to get on um, Lethbridge Housing if they're a, you know, um, have kids or, you know, even if they're single in order and stuff, we try to do that. Um, uh, we, we never ever say, you know, like, oh, I forgot the part about re relapse. Um, if they relapse and they come back to us, we tell them we, it's mandatory for them to go back to detox and probably back to a treatment center. So we don't 100% give up on them. And once they've moved on and even out our doors, we still don't. We're still always there to support them 100%. If they come back to us and they need something, whether it's a phone call, they need food, or they need any kind of things, we help to get the resources just to still help them because we don't believe on giving up on anybody even after they've left our program. Uh, we do have a men's program as well right now that just started. It's called Exodus and is running amazingly. It's got uh, quite a few men in it. They're running almost the same kind of program that, way up, that we are. So it has the first, the second stage, and the third stage as well. And we've seen quite a bit of success in the, in the while that it's been working. Um, they are required us to do the same rules and programming as we have for our women. It's, it, 
pretty much there, there's a few differences but not a lot and we've already seen really great successes in the men's program as well um, two of the men are getting ready already to move out on their own they've got good jobs they're working hard and you know they finished doing their programming and stuff and so we've seen this success but success doesn't always mean that they've always moved out into houses and success is also just seeing a client come in for a brief 10 minutes is if it's in the streets alive and just come in and or even to into my building and have an hour conversation and talk to me about wanting to recover right that hour of sobriety that that ha that they have or the feeling that they get when they put a nice pair of warm socks on or a nice warm jacket when they're out in the out in the, wi the winter and the weather that's success to them too we have big successes and we have small successes and we acknowledge them all because without acknowledging them where is the hope for them to get better and we are a faith-based program so we do have our faith and we, b we believe strongly that our faith has helped in many, many cases. I know I wouldn't be here if I never found a God in my life to help me to be able to get to where I am, plus the supports and everything else that I have. So, yeah. That's all that I have to say. <laughs> Thank you.